Good afternoon. My name is Cameron Bertuzzi. I'm here with Dr. John C. Peckham, and today we're talking about sola scriptura. Is scripture or the Bible, is it the only infallible source of authority that we have? And so that's the, the topic that we're talking about today. And let me go ahead and uh, just introduce real quickly who my guest is. Dr. John C. Peckham is professor of theology and Christian philosophy at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary of Andrews University in Bur Bur Berrien Springs? Berrien Springs. Berrien yeah. Springs. Uh, Peckham has written a number of books, most recently The, the Theodicy of Love. Put that up on the screen here so you can see. It's one of my... Uh, it's a, it's a really good book so far. I'm, I'm only about a third way into it, but I really like it. The uh, The cover art's also really beautiful, as you can see. So he wrote that. He also has written some other books, uh, namely, the one that's going to interest us most today is Canonical Theology, and he basically gives a defense of Sola Scriptura and some other, uh, and basically a canonical view of theology from a Protestant point of view. Super, super good book. I highly, highly recommend this one. This one I've read, and it is super good. We're going to talk about a little bit of it today. And I think that's pretty much what people need to know about you. Is there anything else? Did I, did I leave anything important out? I, I think that covers it. All right. Well, thank you for coming on the show. It's great. Uh, you and I actually had a, a little chat before I had my debate with uh, a lot of our viewers will know Matt Frad. He and I debated Sola Scriptura not too long ago. And so I had a phone call with you and we talked about some uh, some of your ideas, which I think are are really, really good. And you've got a definition of Sola Scriptura that avoids a lot of the common objections that are thrown at it. So why don't we dive right in and do that? So what is your view of Sola Scriptura? Because the, the title of this video is Toward a Defensible View of This. There's a lot of objections to Sola Scriptura. So what is your formulation of it, the one that you think avoids most of the objections? Yeah, I think it's crucial to frame it correctly because, as you know, Sola Scriptura is understood in different ways by different people. So I want to say at the outset that when I say that I affirm sola scriptura, I do not mean by that nuda scriptura or the idea that scripture is by itself cut off from any other resources or to the exclusion of any other kind of factor. Uh, when I am speaking of sola scriptura, I am seeking to answer the question, what has uniquely normative authority other than God himself for faith and practice? So the basic way I would define sola scriptura, I refer it to I refer to it as canonical sola scriptura to set it apart from that more reductionist kind of view that is scripture by itself, that nuda scriptura. I call it cano canonical sola scriptura, and by that I mean that scripture is the uniquely normative rule and standard of Christian faith, but not the only resource. So uniquely normative relative to any other resource other than God himself. All right, let me pull up this slide, and this is what I used in my debate with Matt Frad on Sola Scriptura. I got this from your book, so why don't we mm -hmm. go through these three different these three different criteria or definition, whatever you want to call them. Why don't we go through these three, And because I think all of them are important. Yeah, those three tenets, uh, it, can be, it can be reduced to the idea that Scripture is uniquely normative, but those three tenets were three ways that I am proposing that Scripture— is alone or is unique. Again, not in the reductionistic sense, but in the sense that it is unique in these three ways. So number one, I believe that scripture is the uniquely infallible source of divine revelation that is available to contemporary humans collectively. And we can unpack that a bit as we go forward, why why I believe that's the case and precisely what I mean by that. Uh, but basically, yeah, it, I mean that... It's a, go ahead. I was just going to say that it's important in, in my dialogue with Matt, it was important to, to point out that this is compatible with oral tradition being normative at the time of the Absolutely. apostles. Absolutely. That's a crucial point. And that's why I mean uh, available collectively today. So I believe that scripture just consists of the divinely commissioned, covenantal, prophetic, and apostolic testimony. So God commissioned this prophetic and apostolic testimony, and he gave this particular kind of prophetic and apostolic testimony. I use the word covenantal because it's witnessing to the covenant events of God in history, the New Testament being the supreme witness to the new covenant, the Christ event. Uh, if, if scripture is it consists of that prophetic and apostolic testimony, then all we need to say that it's uniquely authoritative or uniquely normative uh, is to have some ground to believe that scripture consists 
of that prophetic and apostolic testimony that God has commissioned to function as this unique rule of faith. But in New Testament times, while the New Testament was being written, the oral uh, testimony of the apostles would carry that ruling authority, at least when they are speaking under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So it's not the exclusion of that kind of oral tradition. But today, I don't believe we have any confident way to access the oral tradition of the apostolic testimony, but we have the written tradition. And by tradition, I just mean that which has been passed down to us. So it's important at the outset to recognize that uh, canonical sola scriptura is not to the exclusion of tradition of any kind. It's to the exclusion of a normative extra canonical tradition, because tradition just means something that's been passed down to us. And scripture itself has been passed down to us, as has the very language we're speaking in right now. All right. So let's move on to the, the second criteria. So the second one is scripture alone provides a sufficient and fully trustworthy norm of theology. And by that, I mean that scripture is unique in that no other normative source other than God is needed. It is sufficient for salvation. And so that criterion is just showing that scripture is unique in the way that many Protestants have affirmed about the sufficiency of scripture uh, to teach us about the core truths of Christian faith and salvation. And then number three? Number three, Scripture is the uniquely authoritative and final norm of theological interpretation that norms all others. And here I'm specifically focusing on normativity with regard to interpretation, which is crucial in the discussion. That Scripture is not just uniquely normative as a source, as that divinely commissioned prophetic and apostolic source of faith and practice, but it's also uniquely normative as the standard by which uh, theological claims should be judged, and the standard by which interpretations themselves should be judged. All right, so I think that's a a pretty good place to start. All right, so one of the biggest objections to Sola Scriptura, and by the way, we're actually going to do a lot of Q&A today, and so if you are a Catholic or you reject Sola Scriptura and you have some objections to it, you have some questions about it, then start to write those in the live chat. You can tag me, or if you want to send it in as a super chat, that's the easiest way for me to find it and pull it up, pull it up on the screen. So, but yeah, I, I would love to get objections and and thoughts uh, on Sola Scriptura. And John, he's a professional on this. He's written on it, and so it, this would be a, a great opportunity for you to do that. All right, with that, let's let's talk about one of the most popular objections to Sola Scriptura, and that is that the doctrine is self-refuting because it's not clearly taught in the Bible. So what are your thoughts on this objection? Well, let me let me start by responding to that by saying four things that I outline in my book that sola scriptura does not mean, because that's very important to lay the groundwork. Because if we, again, if we think that sola scriptura means scripture to the exclusion of everything else, then we're going to run into all kinds of problems when it comes to these objections that people raise to a nuda scriptura. And I think that those objections are effective against that kind of sola scriptura, but I don't think they're effective against uh, the kind of sola scriptura I'm advocating for. So first of all, when I affirm sola scriptura, I do not mean to say that scripture is the only source of knowledge, or even that it's the only source of revelation. Scripture itself affirms general revelation. Scripture speaks of extra canonical prophecy, even in New Testament times. Now, the extra canonical prophecy, those prophets, even at the time the apostles were preaching and writing, were themselves subjected to the testimony of apostles. We know that from places like 1 Corinthians 14, where uh, Paul subjects that prophetic witness to his own apostolic, te- uh, I'm sorry, yeah, the, the extra canonical prophets to his own apostolic testimony. So first, I do not mean that scripture is the only source of knowledge or the only source of revelation. Secondly, I do not mean by sola scriptura that all theological doctrine or church practices require direct biblical statements. It only requires that a claim is properly derived from scripture. Third, by sola scriptura, I do not mean that tradition Uh, the history of Christian thought should be dismissed or ignored. Rather, we should pay very close attention to it, Uh, but we should just not make it normative. It should be subjected to Scripture itself. And fourth, when I say sola scriptura, I do not mean that Scripture excludes reason. We couldn't even be having this conversation without using our faculty of reason. We couldn't even read without reason. Does not exclude, uh, does not require private interpretation. Does not mean that we're reading Scripture by ourselves. I think scripture should be read within community and across communities. I just don't think we should make anything outside of scripture normative 
over Scripture, again, of course, other than God himself. So with that groundwork to your specific question about whether sola scriptura is actually derived from Scripture itself, what I would say is to uh, to defeat the objection that sola scriptura is self-defeating in that way, all we need to be able to show is that the principle of sola scriptura can be properly derived from Scripture. And I would argue that you can show that the, the principles taught in the Bible, if applied today, amount to the claim that Scripture is uniquely normative. Now, uh, it's, it's not a controversial claim among Christians, at least, that Scripture has a kind of authority as God breathed, the way 2 Timothy 3.16 puts it, that there are many, many texts that speak of a unique kind of authority that is afforded to Scripture. And all that is needed to show sola scriptura of the kind that I'm advocating for is to show that the Bible includes within itself teachings that Scripture is uniquely normative uh, over other factors. So if we were to delineate those factors, uh, often people talk about other ingredients uh, alongside Scripture in theology, such as reason, experience, and tradition. And we could also add extra-canonical prophecy. Uh, so with regard to reason, there are many texts in the Bible itself that give us reason uh, to not make our own judgments, our own reason normative. So you have 1 Corinthians 3, 19 through 20, that talks about the wisdom of the world being foolishness in God's eyes. Proverbs 28, 26 says, the one who trusts in his own heart is a fool. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. All of those things would mean that those factors are subordinated to divine teachings. And if scripture are those God breathed, scripture consists of those God breathed teachings, then even our own reason experience would be subjected to scripture. So scripture would be uniquely normative over our reason and experience. When it comes to tradition, uh, we have places, uh, first of all, I need to be clear that when I say scripture is authoritative over tradition, I don't mean by that that all tradition is bad or all traditions are excluded but just that there is should not be a normative tradition that stands over and against scripture itself. So one place that's helpful that I think showing that helpful in showing that scripture or the Bible itself teaches that tradition is normed by scripture or by the word of God is in Matthew 15. Now, in Matthew 15, Jesus is engaged in dialogue with some Jewish leaders and he accuses them of effectively undermining the word of God for the sake of their tradition, particularly in the way that they are uh, allowing uh, the honoring of one's father and mother to be avoided by a particular oath that one takes. And he, he criticizes them for making the word of God of no effect because of their traditions. Now, in that case, of course, he's referring to particular traditions of the, the Jewish community and the Jewish leadership. But I think that principle would apply that traditions should be subjected to the word of God, should be subjected to the authority of teachings that come from God. And if scripture consists of those kinds of teachings, then scripture would be uniquely normative over tradition, including later Christian traditions, without dismissing uh, those traditions entirely. It's just that they don't have a kind of authority. You also have Acts 5.29, where Peter says, in response to those who say he should stop preaching the gospel to the authorities of his day, he says, we ought to obey God rather than men. And you have this kind of principle that runs throughout Scripture. And then with regard to extra-canonical prophecy, I already mentioned 1 Corinthians 14, uh, 37 and 38. Paul uh, says that if anyone doesn't accept his teachings, then they should not be recognized as a prophet. That's a paraphrase of those texts. But in a nutshell, I believe that Scripture itself teaches the principle— that scripture, whatever that is, is uniquely normative over these other ingredients, reason, experience, tradition, and any extra canonical prophecy. As you know, of course, the next objection is going to be, well, what then is scripture? Well, that's not where I'm going to go. I'm going to go to yeah. back to Matthew 15. And so this is one of the okay. things that Matt brought up in my debate with him, was that in Matthew 15, it doesn't seem to necessarily teach that human tra or that, that that tradition simpliciter is uh, not at the equal level of normativity as scripture. It just says that some human traditions are not at that level. So it doesn't get you sort of all the way there. 
to sola scriptura or to, to saying that tradition is always subjected to the word of God. It just says that some human traditions are that, they're human traditions, and they were sort of added to what God had intended, but it doesn't follow from that necessarily that all tradition is subject to scripture. Yeah, it doesn't follow from that text by itself. And I should say, even as I'm mentioning some texts, I wouldn't, I, this is a cumulative case based on what I take to be the teaching of scripture for a much larger case for the canon that I lay out in the first three chapters of my book as a particular kind of co covenantal, prophetic, and apostolic testimony that is uniquely divinely commissioned by God. And so not one of these texts by themselves is going to get you all the way there, but as the cumulative case, I think there's a strong case to be made. Now, I, I already wouldn't rule out tradition small t in general, because we have things that are passed down to us, even scripture is passed down to us. But I think what Jesus says there in verse 3 of Matthew 15, he says, why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition. I would uh, argue that that makes a strong case that uh, the commandment of God, the word of God, is to be normative over any tradition that is not identified as the commandment of God or the word of God, right? And I would, I think the kind of tradition that we have, that which has been passed down, that actually comes from the prophets and apostles that were uniquely divinely commissioned by God, uh, to deposit this testimony as the rule of faith, I that's think excellent. that just consists of what's in Scripture itself. So that's excellent. I, I, yeah, I, none of these should be used as as standalone proof texts. They're just parts of Scripture that point in that direction. But there's a lot of information, other information throughout Scripture, right? Because you have the community in Jesus' own day. Uh, some of the community rejects Jesus himself but he's still the Messiah, right? You have prophets in the Old Testament that are rejected by their own community. So there is a, a potential problem with affording a, a normative kind of authority to a particular community or a particular tradition that comes from humans. And if somebody wants to say the tradition is divinely commissioned to be authoritative, well, then I would just want to ask, uh, how do we know that? And then I would ask which tradition, because the tradition is not monolithic. Then I would ask whose interpretation of that tradition and finally, I would ask, and hopefully we'll come back to this later, is that claim itself that there's a normative tradition outside of Scripture, is that claim itself consistent with the Christian tradition? Uh, I think Augustine and others make some statements that would call that in, into question. Interesting. Okay, so this was one of the things I pointed out in, in my debate with, with Matt, is that it seems like this whole debate comes, to, like the whole Sola Scriptura question, comes down to where do you draw the line when divine revelation or special revelation sort of stopped. I think like to me, it's, it's only because going back to your definition yeah. and your view of, of the canon, you believe that the canon was commissioned by or, or commissioned for or to the people, the, the apostles that were closest to Jesus were the people that God commissioned to write the new Testament. And at that time there was oral tradition that was going around, but it seems like, and you and I talked about this too, before I did the debate with Matt is that it seems like the best or the most the, perhaps the safest view of like who mm -hmm. these people were were the people that were closest to Jesus. It's a, you call it a Christocentric view of the canon. Yeah. So exactly. it seems to me. So, let me let me uh, just sorry to, to to sort of finish the point that I was trying to make here is that was when it comes to sola scriptura, if we have this Christocentric view of what the canon is, then it seems like. The question then for us is when does divine revelation stop? Does it stop at the end when these when the apostles that were closest to Jesus died or does it continue? Is there a sort of apostolic succession that is continuing the divine revelation today? Right. And and that question relates directly to the question of the closing of the canon. And I would set it apart as distinct from whether there is any kind of divine revelation after that. Um, I, First Corinthians gives us a uh, testimony about other prophecy, even at the time of the New Testament authors. And I think there's reason to believe that there would be prophecy after the time of the New Testament authors. But those prophecies themselves are to be tested by the apostolic testimony. So what makes that apostolic testimony a kind of final testimony? Well, here again, I think of this as a cumulative case uh, uh, argument that is kind of organic. And the way I think of it, as you, as you alluded to there, is that Christ stands at the center of these covenants, the covenantal revelation that God has given. He fulfills the revelation of the old covenants, which is the Old Testament, 
And he himself, the Christ of Vet, is just uh, bringing in the new covenant. And the witness to the Christ of Vet, the teachings of his apostles and close associates to him, the witness to this Christ of Vet, just is the New Testament. This the Christ event, of course, is an unrepeatable event, and he commissions apostles to preach this testimony about him throughout the entire world, and for that testimony to be available to future generations in a reliable way includes not only oral preaching, but also putting that down in writing. So you have this unrepeatable Christ event, and then you have an un unrepeatable first-generation apostolic witness to the Christ event. And this first generation unrepeatable witness to the Christ event is what provides this cloud of witnesses that nothing that comes later can contest. So the simplest way to think of it, I think, is that the ruler confirms the Old Testament and he commissions the New Testament through these this apostolic witness. And after the ruler goes away, nothing can equal that rule until the ruler himself returns. And so the canon is effectively closed by the fact that this covenantal revelation ends when the Christ commissioned first generation of apostles is no longer alive. And we have reason to believe in scripture that Jesus promised that Jesus, that the Holy Spirit would lead this apostolic community into all truth and that they give us the testimony that's sufficient about this new covenant revelation of Jesus himself. And I would say there's a number of strands just in the teachings that, if applied today, require something like what I'm defining as sola scriptura. So if you're going to apply, like Paul's uh, statement in Galatians 1.8, where he says, if anyone comes to you, even an angel from heaven, or even I myself, preaching to you a teaching different than what you've received from us, uh, then you should not listen to them. You should turn them away. Well, how do we apply that today, except by going back to the writings that we have good reason to believe came back from that uh, first-generation apostolic community themselves. And there's many other texts that make that kind of claim. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us to prove all things. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.15, I think it is, tells us to stand firm in the traditions we have received in word or in writing. And again, those, those traditions are the traditions of the apostles, and we don't have the oral traditions anymore in a way that we can have confidence in, but we still have the written tradition that was deposited in writing. And I think a strong case can be made much more than I can lay out there in just a few sentences that the New Testament is that uh, divinely commissioned covenantal witness to the Christ event. And if that is the, the ultimate revelation of God, then anything that comes after that is going to be judged by that standard. That is actually a really good point or a place to plug your book again, Canonical Theology. If you want to get more details on his views and how all of this relates to Sola Scriptura, this is the book to buy. Super good. I highly recommend picking it up and giving it a read. Even if you don't agree with Sola Scriptura, this is probably the best defense of it that you're going to find out there. And I don't know if you're going to agree with that, John, out of humility, but I I, I think that's right. Um, so let's go to uh, some Q&A. How does that sound? Sounds good. Okay, so here's our first question from Colt Correa. He says, oh, and thank you for the, uh, sending this as a super chat, Colt. He says, if biblical inerrancy is important, why did God allow corruption and not preserve it perfectly? Many examples exist here are second, or yeah, 2 John 7, 51 through 8, 11, and Mark 16, 9 through 20 were added in by scribes in the fourth century. Right, so I believe that scripture is infallible, and I do believe that God revealed uh, what he wanted prophets and apostles to understand to them, uh, including through events of history like the life and teachings of Jesus, and that the Holy Spirit worked to inspire those prophets and apostles to communicate that teaching in a way that still remained trustworthy, even though those prophets and apostles were allowed to communicate that teaching in their own words. Then you have the... Uh, transcribing of those original autographs that we don't have anymore, like the first letter that Paul uh, wrote to the Romans, for instance. You have the, the textual transmission of the, the witness of the, the manuscripts that are passed down to us. Through those, we can see that the scripture have come down to us basically as they were written. And I think that God has actually providentially 
brought it about so that Scripture has come to us in a way that it is trustworthy in what it affirms, even though it is given in human words. So I see the Bible as God's word in human words, and many of the things that people think uh, actually undermine the infallibility, infallibility of Scripture, I think those are just due to the human medium that Scripture is delivered through, which doesn't undermine the trustworthiness of what is being conveyed. I myself believe that God doesn't determine history. Uh, that goes to my other work that you talked about earlier. So I believe in indeterminism, so I don't believe that God is removing free will, even that of the prophets and the apostles. But I believe that God guides the process such that Scripture is written in a way that's infallible and then is also preserved for us in a way that we can have confidence in Scripture and that it actually comes to us as that divinely commissioned Word of God. There's much more to say about that, but that's a kind of a starting point. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, here's here's a, a good question. This wasn't sent in as a super chat, but I was reading it. Uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on this. Asada al-Islam says, Sola Scripture, the Catholics have 66 books, the Protestants 80, the Oriental Orthodox 81, etc. What scripture are you talking about? Right. So this is a great question. And here I would say that the claim that the Bible teaches the principle of Sola Scriptura, that scripture is uniquely normative, is distinct from the question of what books count as scripture and must be distinguished. And I, I try to distinguish that very carefully in my own work. So in my view, the canon of scripture is the so-called Protestant canon of the 66 books. But one could disagree with me about that and still accept the claim of sola scriptura specifically. Now, why adopt one set rather than the others? Uh, that's a much longer conversation about what makes canonical books canonical. But in brief, as I see it, uh, I hold a view that I call an intrinsic canon model, that books are canonical in virtue of being divinely commissioned as this unique kind of covenantal revelation. And that means uh, writings would be canonical if God commissioned them as such, whether or not you or I recognize them as such analogous to the way that Jesus is the Messiah, whether or not I recognize him as my Savior, right? He's the Savior, and he cannot be my Savior unless I recognize him, but he's the Savior whether I recognize him or not. So the question then is, how do we come to recognize those books? And I argue that there are traits that canonical books would have. They have evidence of divine commission. Namely, they would be covenant, uh, prophetic and apostolic, uh, and even scripture itself talks about the church being built on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. Second Peter 3, 2 tells us to remember uh, the, the prophetic and apostolic testimony. And uh, a second would be consistency with past revelation. And third would be that these books are unlike others. They are self-authenticating. Now, those are traits of canonicity. And I think we have enough evidence passed down to us, thankfully, uh, from the from earlier Christians that were faithful to pass down the evidence to us to actually recognize uh, a particular set of books as those books that God has commissioned. In addition to those traits, and here is where when I say that uh, sola scriptura, I don't mean to rule out tradition at all. I just mean to rule out a normative tradition. To say that we can identify canonical books as having those three traits is not to say that we ignore the tradition. We actually look to what has been passed down to us in Christian history as testimony. Not that makes it the case that these are the right books because Christians have said so, but that counts as evidence. So it's analogous to the way that if I was in a courtroom, uh, one might appeal to a witness, an eyewitness, say, to a murder to give testimony about whether somebody is guilty. But the testimony itself doesn't make that person guilty or innocent, but it counts as evidence. And the cloud of witnesses of the early church fathers counts as strong testimony as well that we have identified at least what some people call the common canonical core of scripture, that we've identified that correctly. Sometimes when people get into the argument over canon, they mistakenly think that there is a whole lot of diversity about what books are canonical. But really, uh, nearly all Christians accept the 66 books, but some Christians accept more than those books. But and uh, Roman Catholics and Eastern, namely the Old Testament, Apostle Orthodox, uh, number those a bit differently and have a slightly different set of uh, Old Testament apocryphal books. But the common canonical core is witnessed to very strongly uh, among the testimony of the Church Fathers, and I think there is good evidence 
that those writings meet the traits that canonical books would have. Again, I can't give an argument that would be convincing here. I could just gesture uh, towards the kind of outline that I would give and say, if you want more on that, I would encourage you to look at the first uh, three chapters of canonical theology. And on the New Testament canon about recognizing the canon uh, without appealing to a normative authority that makes the canon canon, Michael Kruger's work is very helpful as well. His book, Canon Revisited, makes a very strong case and goes in detail through some of the church fathers about how canonical books were recognized far earlier than some treatments of canon have recognized. Uh, and, and that's very interesting as well to look into. So in a nutshell, there's traits of canonicity we can recognize canonical books as, and the uh, testimony of earlier Christians also counts as evidence, as does the testimony, by the way, of uh, early, early Jews like Josephus and others with regard to the Old Testament. So before we get to the next question, let me just remind everyone, if you're watching this, you're enjoying the content so far, make sure to subscribe and hit the little bell and turn on notifications to uh, get notifications when we post new videos. Also, we have like 235 people watching live right now, and we only have 69 likes on this video. So if you can, just tap the little thumbs up button and uh, give us some engagement, and that'll help us out on YouTube as well. All right, here is a question from Paul Rimmer. He sent this in as a super chat, so thank you so much, Paul. He says, can sola scriptura still make some sense without inerrancy or infallibility? If so, how so? Yes, I think it could. I think one could just say that Scripture is uniquely normative in some way. And if one wants to ask what Scripture is, you could, you could, you could argue it this way. You could say, you could define Scripture as that prophetic and apostolic testimony that God has commissioned as the covenantal rule or standard. And whether or not somebody accepts a view of inerrancy or infallibility, one could distinguish that from a unique norm of scripture identified as those prophetic and apostolic writings. And that brings us back to the question of canon. How do you identify those books, which is uh, an important question, a related question, but a distinct question. Yeah. And it's such a good question. And your discussion of it in your book is super, super helpful. I really like how you, you pulled on a lot of people's work. You mentioned Kruger and, and uh, some others as well, but yeah, so it's, I can't recommend this book enough. Cannot recommend it enough, especially if you're interested in the question of the canon from a Protestant perspective Get it. All right, here, here we go. Next question from Matt Boyer. Thank you for sending this as a super chat, Matt. He says, how does Sola Scriptura not fall under the category of Christian tradition? If Catholics assembled the Bible, is our disagreement not tradition? Right, so there's a number of things there. We, we, we would probably have a different view about who assembled the Bible, quote unquote. I think actually when we look at what I call the history of canon recognition, what we see is a relatively messy history. So it's not all recognized at once by some kind of like central authority or clearinghouse. And that's consistent with a kind of approach that I lay out as intrinsic canonicity. And the canon is recognized organically over time. When you look at the witness of early Christians, um, the way I understand church history, I don't think there is a Roman Catholic church, uh, quote unquote, until centuries later. And there is strong evidence of recognition of the New Testament books among Christians before there is anything like uh, primacy of the Bishop of Rome, for instance. So uh, if you go back to Kruger's work in uh, Canon Revisited, he lays this out in some detail. But you actually find that the early uh, Christians— are signal in their work what they're looking for when they're accepting certain works as scripture and other works not as scripture. And they don't all agree at the same time. But very, very early, already with Papias in 8115, the four gospels are standard. And those are essentially accepted by the early Christians as canonical. I'm using that word maybe anachronistically, but what I mean by canonical is as the rule or standard that is unequaled. They're, they're recognized as canonical just in, in virtue of being recognized as the testimony to what Jesus actually said and did. So you have the ruler himself, and then you have the Gospels being the testimony from his apostles of what he said and did. So those are uniquely authoritative just right off the bat, as soon as they're recognized to be the Gospels that actually come from those first-generation eyewitnesses. Then you have this set of, of letters of Paul, uh, and any letters that are recognized to come actually from Paul, who himself is a bona fide apostle, meeting the resurrected Christ, are accepted by the Christian community as authoritative in virtue of him being a commissioned apostle of Christ. And you see some evidence that already in the times the New Testament are written, that the letters of Paul are recognized as scripture. It doesn't tell us which letters, but some letters of Paul, a collection of Paul's writings are referred to in 2 Peter 3, I think it's 15 through 16, and referred to as scripture. 
And then you have a third set of books like the General Epistles and Revelation, and those books took a little bit longer, especially as Christianity was spreading all over the globe. You don't have communication like you have today. You don't have a central authority that's telling uh, people uh, these books and not those ones. They're not being disseminated all at once because you don't have codices yet, right? So you have things being passed along in fragmentary ways. But they're looking for, in those writings also, are these genuinely coming from apostles or close associates? And if they were recognized to be coming from apostles or close associates, they were recognized as canonical. And the Shepherd of Hermas is a case in point. Many people thought the book was inspired. Some people thought maybe it should be canonical until we have some some writings that suggest they, in some places at least, they discovered that it was written too late to come from the actual first generation apostles, and therefore it cannot be included in the canon. That's just one line of evidence in that direction. So I would not agree that a particular church denomination uh, assembled the Bible or determined the Bible. I do agree that faithful Christians throughout the ages passed down the uh, genuine prophetic and apostolic writings for us and also passed on testimony that counts a great deal as evidence. But again, similar to the way that I could appeal to a witness in a court of law as evidence in a particular trial without claiming that that particular witness is themselves normative or makes it the case, I can do the same thing when it comes to the testimony of uh, church fathers in the Christian tradition. And I, I think, I think as I alluded to before, that somebody who wants to say, uh, and I, I recognize all Roman Catholics, I don't think would want to make this argument, but some who want to say that there is a normative tradition outside of Scripture that determines what Scripture is, I think that's going to run into conflict with what the early church fathers themselves say about Scripture. And I'm not appealing to that authoritatively. I'm not saying Scripture is authoritative because they say it is, but one who appeals to tradition as uniquely normative, their claim should be consistent with what that tradition itself says. And because my kind of sola scriptura, canonical sola scriptura, does not rule out other resources, I'm going to use all resources at my disposal, including history, including what has been passed down to us, then appealing to that as testimony is not inconsistent with holding scripture as uniquely normative. As long as I don't make some other resource uh, normative uh, over and against scripture, then it's consistent with canonical sola scriptura. All right, here's a question from Jack Sheen, I think. Yep. All right, uh, thank you for your super chat. Jack, he says, Catholic here, love your work, Cameron. My problem with sola scriptura is that it presupposes the script scriptura. How can we trust in an infallible canon without an infallible church to put it together? Yeah, yeah, great question. And I just want to say I'm painfully aware as I try to answer these questions of how insufficient my answers are because there's so much more that I would want to say about each topic. Um, but in this regard, I, 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 this is an objection that's raised a lot. I just don't agree that an infallible norm would require another infallible source to tell us that that is that an infallible source. So if we actually grant that in order to recognize scripture as an infallible norm, uh, we would have to have some other infallible source to tell us that, then the question is, well, what is our infallible source for the infallible source that tells us that scripture is the infallible source? And I think that can go on ad infinitum, right? So if you need an infallible source to establish an infallible source, then it would seem that you need an infallible source to establish the infallible source you appeal to, to, to actually ground the other infallible source. And so you run into a problem, I think, if you go that direction. I think scripture is grounded in infallible source. That infallible source is God himself. But the recognition of the canon, we can do through what has been preserved to us and passed down to us without appealing to a unique norm outside of scripture, while at the same time not cutting ourselves off from all of the resources of Christian history, for which we should be very thankful. Uh, I think there is a positive role for tradition to play. I just think it should be continually subjected to the normative authority of Scripture itself. So I just don't agree that you need uh, an infallible, infallible source to tell you uh, what counts as Scripture. And if you did, then what makes that source infallible? And then who interprets that source? A number of other questions arise. Yeah, uh, here, let me say two things in, in response to that as well. So, in, in I got all this from your book as well. So it's not like like I just came up with this off 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 the top of my head. So one of the things I I noticed early on in my 
investigation research into Sola Scriptura is that there seems to be like a conflation between what determines the canon, canon and how we recognize the canon, like how we exactly. recognize what books are in the canon. And so on mm-hmm. your view, you have an in- intrinsic view of the canon. And so God is ultimately the source of the canon of scripture. But that is a separate question from how we come to know or come to recognize what the books in the canon are. And you've already given a number of different criteria that you think fit or would be features of books that belong in the canon. And so that's that's the, the, the whole thing here is, yeah, but, but then the question is, don't we need an infallible source or an infallible church in order to tell us what books are belong in the canon? And here's something that you raised, and you, you even mentioned this a little bit earlier on and said maybe we'll get to this later, is that if we need an infallible source like the church in order to tell us like what books are in the canon of Scripture, well, then what church is the infallible, like which tradition— Right. That's the question. Mm -hmm. Which tradition are you appealing to? And if you can't answer, if like, if we need an infallible source, then you also need an infallible source to determine which church tradition, because there are two churches who claim tradition, at least there's at least two, you know, there's the Eastern tradition Mm -hmm. and the Mm -hmm. Roman Catholic tradition. And if you don't have an infallible source telling you which church is the true church, then you seem to be in the same position. So I just don't think that this is a really good objection to Sola Scriptura at all. Yeah, I would agree with you. And thank you. Thank you for laying that out, I think, probably better than I did. Uh, that distinction is so important, because when I say that the, the principle of sola scriptura is properly derived from Scripture, all I mean by that is that the Bible, taken as a cumulative case, uh, makes the case that Scripture, whatever that is, is uniquely normative. And then it's a separate question, what counts as Scripture? And I don't think that we have a, a way of identifying a community that is actually sufficient to determine the canon. If you just look in the story of Scripture itself, you have prophets that are being rejected by their own community. Jesus himself is rejected by his own community, but that community was itself elected by God and guided by God, at least at times in their history. And so the idea that there is some collective community that God is going to appoint as normative over and against the prophetic and apostolic witness that he gives, I think that is mistaken. I recognize that uh, not many Catholics would would argue it that way, the way I just put it. I don't mean to put that uh, in the mouth of the Catholic interlocutor. Uh, But the way I understand it, uh, you don't need an extra canonical normative arbiter to decide these things. And I think actually that this kind of unique primacy of Scripture, unique normativity of Scripture, there are things within the Christian tradition itself that point in this direction. And I raise this not, I'm not appealing to that and saying that's why I believe it. I'm just saying if you appeal to tradition as something that should be uniquely normative aside, alongside scripture, then you might run into problems with things that some of the church fathers said. So for instance, uh, Augustine says this, this is from uh, against Faustus the Manichaean, 11.5, at least part of it's from there. He says, as regard our writings, which are not a rule of faith or practice, but only a help to edification. We may suppose that they contain some things falling short of the truth. There is a distinct boundary line separating all productions subsequent to apostolic times from the authoritative canonical books of the Old and New Testaments. The authority of these books has come down to us from the apostles through the succession. I would just just read on the succession, but the, the point remains that he's making about the primacy of Scripture from the apostles through the succession of bishops and the extension of the church, and from a position of lofty supremacy, claims the submission of every faithful and pious mind. Then he goes on to say the canon shows to have, to have been, uh, we should submit ourselves, rather he says, in consequence of the distinctive peculiarity of the sacred writings, we are bound to receive as true whatever the canon shows to have been said by even one prophet or apostle or evangelist. And then, also, and against uh, Faustus the Manichaean, he says, when extra canonical writings, including his own, he says, he says, they offer merely a profitable study, unquote, but one owes, quote, unhesitating assent to nothing but the canonical scriptures, unquote. Now, again, he may have a different view of how those scriptures are recognized, and people may have different views of which books count as scripture, with Augustine uh, wanting to include Old Testament Apocrypha, whereas I myself would not consider those to be canonical. But the claim that he's making uh, about the primacy of canon seems relatively clear to me. And I'm not suggesting you can't find other things in other early church fathers or Augustine that would run counter to that, but you still have to account for these kinds of statements. You have Gregory of Nyssa making similar statements about 
uh, the primacy of biblical warrant. You have Irenaeus himself that seems to uphold a standard of of these scriptures as holding supreme authority and many, many others. All right, here's the uh, the next question from In Dirish. Thank you for your super chat, Indirish. He says, why should I accept the tradition of Sola Scriptura invented by men over the tradition of the one true church with apostolic succession left by God? Would you be, would you debate Dr. Sungenus or Sungenus? I don't know how to pronounce that on this issue. Well, my aim here is not to try to make a, a negative case against other views. I'm really trying to make a positive case for Sola Scriptura. So I want to I want to say that in general. And I, I wouldn't want somebody to accept sola scriptura viewed as a tradition of men. What I would ask them is to ask, what does scripture teach about the authority of the prophetic and apostolic writings that are included in scripture itself? And if you're to follow those teachings, like what Paul says in Galatians 1.8, uh, what Paul affirms in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, where he affirms his audience for receiving the word of God that he delivered to them, not only as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. The way the Bereans in Acts 17 were actually um, affirmed as noble-minded because they received the word uh, eagerly and uh, looked to scriptures to see whether these things were so, even though those things were the word of God. So even the apostles were expecting their writings to be tested by earlier scriptures. I think there is a cloud of witnesses from those who we have good reason to believe are divinely commissioned prophets and apostles to suggest that the writings they delivered to us should be uniquely normative. And then from then you would take another, you would take another step to say scripture is, is what corresponds to that prophetic and apostolic witness. And I think a case can be made that there are fathers in the tradition itself that would agree with the primacy of that prophetic and apostolic testimony. And then we just come back to the question of canon. So I don't want uh, someone to follow a tradition of mere humans in any respect, whether it's set out by individual scholars or whether it's set out by particular denominations. I would want uh, any particular claim that we're going to make uh, as a foundational normative claim to itself be tested by this witness of the prophets and apostles that I'm convicted is divinely commissioned to function as a unique covenantal rule. Others can disagree with me on that. Uh, I understand there's a, a lot more factors to consider than what we're putting on the table here. But I think the only way for me to be faithful to the way the New Testament writers speak about their apostolic authority and the way the New Testament writers, including Jesus himself, refers to the authority of the Old Testament, the law and the prophets that Jesus uh, used to... Uh, to show to his followers on the road to Emmaus everything about himself, uh, many other ways scripture is used. The way for me to apply that today in the 21st century, cut off from those communities uh, it, historically, is actually to go back to the writings that I think we have good reason have been transmitted to us faithfully. And just as an aside there, it's always striking to me that in that account uh, on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, uh, for those that are listening, this is after Jesus has died and risen from the dead, but he meets two, two followers of, of his on the road to Emmaus, and they don't know that he's resurrected yet. And instead of actually just uh, revealing himself to them and saying, here I am, guys, I've resurrected, what does he do? He first actually goes through, the way it said in Luke 24, the law and the prophets and the Psalms and teaches them from them all the things concerning himself, the Messiah. And then later he reveals who he is. So there he's appealing to what I would consider a proto-canonical approach, even in the way that he affirms that scripture had prophesied what would happen to him and that he'd be risen from the dead, among other things. So I just think the, the most faithful way to apply the teachings in the Bible that uh, Christians hold in common uh, is a kind of sola scriptura. Now, I'm not concerned whether somebody adopts the slogan sola scriptura. I'm only concerned about whether the books that are actually divinely commissioned to function as the rule are actually allowed to function as a rule. And so if the slogan is what is the impediment, uh, I know the word sola, often people think that means scripture by itself or scripture cut off from everything else. That's not what I mean by it. That's not what uh, the most Protestants have meant by it at least those that are writing about it. Uh, I, I recognize that some have misunderstood it on both sides, and sometimes it is misused in that way. But if we're approaching it that way, I think there is good reason uh, to follow Scripture as uniquely normative. 
All right. Here's a question from Nick Quiant, and he's actually a, a patron of ours. And he he and I talk every now and then about biblical stuff. He's a I think he's a student somewhere. He's getting his master's or PhD. He's work he's working on uh, getting a getting a degree in the Bible. Here's his question: The entire discussion seems to presuppose a specific view of authority within a highly developed ecclesiology. How does that actually impact this debate? Um, I hope that my particular view is not presupposing a highly developed ecclesiology. But I think that Nick is right that some approaches to the Sola Scriptura question are uh, presupposing a highly developed ecclesiology that then makes the church normative. And I think this is where just looking at the history of canon recognition itself actually uh, is very important. And it raises questions about why uh, why there would be kind of a messiness of canon recognition if you have one kind of central church authority in future generations that has been given the authority to tell other Christians which books are the right ones. I don't think we see that kind of developed ecclesiological authority until you have the rise of uh, uh, the Bishop of Rome later on, many centuries later. But by that time, uh, for probably fifth century and later, by that time, you already have Christians attesting to the recognition of these books. And they don't say we accept these books because uh, the church tells us these are the books. Anytime you have later councils that are are actually listing these books in proceedings from the councils, which are all local councils uh, until much, much later, anytime you have that, they're not saying these are the books that we're deciding on now. They're just giving you a record of the books that we have come to accept. But they have come to accept them much earlier, and they come to accept them because they are prophetic and uniquely apostolic from that first generation. So I, I would have a different view of ecclesiology than some who are approaching uh, this discussion. All right, here's a question from David Johnson. Thank you for your super chat, David. Would modern prophets be held to the same standard of infallibility as the biblical authors? So I think that any prophet that would arise after the first generation uh apostolic community has passed away has to be tested by the prophetic testimony that is confirmed by Christ, I believe, and that first generation apostolic witness, which is the New Testament that I believe was commissioned by Christ and in virtue of that has unequaled authority. So any any later prophet should actually be in line with the teachings of the Bible. I think we need to distinguish, even in the Bible, the prophets themselves were not personally infallible, as the apostles themselves were not personally infallible. So when we talk about infallibility, we're talking about what actually is communicated in Scripture under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The technical terms are revealed and inspired. And there's different theories of revelation inspiration. I won't try to go into those details now. But if you have a, a, a later prophet, they're going to have to be tested by that witness. That doesn't mean necessarily that everything they ever said or everything they ever believed has to be infallible uh, in every particular way, because even the writers of Scripture wouldn't meet that standard. But they do need to be continually subjected to the standard of Scripture, because I do not believe that anything can equal the standard of the rule that is put down by Christ. If I'm right in understanding the New Testament, as the witness of that first generation apostolic, uh, Christ commissioned apostolic uh, community. That's what the New Testament is. No other testament, no other prophet can equal that later on. And the way Paul speaks about prophets, even in his day, having to be tested by the word that he delivers, suggests, I think, strongly that even at the time contemporaneously, prophets in the church, at least at Corinth, were to be subjected to the apostolic testimony even then. All right, here's a question that's a little bit off topic, but I'll, I'll go ahead and answer it really quickly from T for Fortune. He says, where can I learn how to make my lighting and overall setup as good as yours, Cam? So I actually recorded a video for our Bereans group, a Bereans, I always make this, I always get this wrong, the pronunciation of it, Bereans group on Facebook, which you can access if you're a patron of Capturing Christianity, that's patreon.com slash Capturing Christianity. The link is in the description of the video. I made a quick video, it's about probably five eight minutes long, where I basically showed my whole setup, how my lights are all set up, my camera, everything, the lights behind me. And so I made that video, it's available. If you want to uh, to find out how I do all my lighting and, and everything, just uh, become a Berean on Facebook, which you can access through Patreon. All right, uh, let's get to the next question here. This one is from the Jason 909. How does Sola Scriptura foster church unity? So this is a great question, and this is 
related to one of the main objections that come up that some people argue that a kind of sola scriptura amounts to a kind of fracturing of Christianity, a kind of hermeneutical pluralism, um, and that therefore it should be rejected. First of all, I would say that the idea of different views and different conclusions is not a problem for sola scriptura in and of itself. I think that is just a byproduct of the fact that we are given this kind of epistemic subjectivity to uh, come to beliefs and form beliefs in a way that each person at the end of the day has to make individual decisions of faith, not in isolation. Canonical sola scriptura does not affirm isolationism, does not affirm private interpretation, uh, but it does affirm that every person has to make a decision for themselves. And even one who wants to say, I'm going to appeal to a particular church or a particular uh, subsection of a church or a teaching office or something like that, even that appeal that they're making to that, first of all, why do they place their faith there? That's a decision they have to make. No one else can make for them. And then whose interpretation of even those in te teachings? Any communication is going to be interpreted, including an interpretation that comes from someone that somebody might want to appoint as an authoritative interpreter. So I don't do not think that sola scriptura in and of itself is something that is going to provide church unity or take away from church unity. You didn't have church unity long before there was the Protestant Reformation. Already you have the East and the Western split in AD 1054. You have other fractures within Christianity that are taking place long before the Reformation. So I don't think it's because of sola scriptura that is uh, causing anything like that. And even today, among different Christian fellowships, including Roman Catholics, you have people that are disagreeing on different points, and they don't claim to have everything in a uniform way. I would say that the unity of Christians, if Christians are identified as those who are united to Christ by faith, the uh, unity of Christians is should be based on union with Christ. And we might have disagreements about other uh, points of faith, but what makes someone a Christian is their allegiance to Christ, not a particular denominational affiliation. And my own allegiance to Christ, based on the way that I understand Scripture as being commissioned by him, my allegiance to him as the ruler, a byproduct of that is that I, I hold Scripture to be uniquely normative in virtue of holding him as the ruler. Now then, what do we do about different views? I think even those who disagree with me, whether they're Protestant or not, whether they uh, follow the approach I take to the canon or not, uh, even somebody who's inclined towards a communitarian direction, that is by appeal to kind of the witness of the community to to put, to put uh, undergird these things. Even on a communitarian argument, which is not my argument, but even on a communitarian argument, you have this common canonical core. So some people appeal to what they call the Vincentian rule from Vincent of Larens in the fifth century, where he says that which is believed by everyone uh, always, uh, by all, in, in all places, right? And so always everyone in all places. And so the I don't think there's anything that has been received and believed by Christians. There's nothing that's universally accepted by all self-identifying Christians, but I don't think anything's been accepted by self-identifying Christians as a source uh, more so than the common canonical core, that 66 books of the Old and New Testament. Many Christians accept more than those books, but very, very, very few self-identifying Christians accept less than those books. So if we could agree on that common canonical core, whether or not somebody agrees with my understanding of the intrinsic canon or sola scriptura, then, and we agree that that is set up as a rule or standard of faith, then we could use that as the test, as the standard by which we judge or by which we measure. The word canon itself is derived from the word of like a reed by which you measure something like a ruler. If we use that as the standard, we can bring our various doctrinal and other claims to that standard and we can ask, do our beliefs measure up to that standard? And we may not agree with one another, but at least we have a common standard by which to have a conversation in, in good faith, uh, ironically, and that actually leads towards uh, further truth, uh, more light than heat, so to speak. Okay, next question from Tanner Terry. Thank you for uh, your super chat, Tanner. He says, do you think these faithful Christians that you put, uh, that you trust to put together and determine the canon believed there was a physical church that had authority on earth? I just want to point out that you, you've you already talked about the fact that you believe that the, the canon, you, you, you have a, a kind of intrinsic model of the canon. And so you think that God determines what is what, what the canon is. And so it's not that you, you have this communitarian model 
where the church or some group of Christians determines the canon. So you already sort of reject some of the assumptions that are in this question. Yes, exactly. Right. I, accept, I reject the premise of the question. I, when I refer to them as faithful Christians, I want to actually make sure we sufficiently appreciate. I mean, unfortunately, sometimes when the discussion comes up, sometimes it can be portrayed or even come across as if we are denying any positive role of earlier Christians and what they passed down to us. And we should be very careful not to do that. And I, we are all indebted to faithful Christians who copied painstakingly uh, the scriptures and passed it down to us and also passed down to us the cloud of witnesses. Uh, I don't believe that the scriptures are the scriptures because they accepted them, but their testimony counts as evidence for me, and we are indebted to them in that way. Now, what they believe about a particular church, I believe that some church fathers and tradition believe that. I believe that others did not. In fact, I think this is one of the problems with appealing to the tradition to be normative. The tradition is not monolithic on a whole host of issues, including uh, the relationship between scripture and tradition, including the issue that this particular question raised. And so I wouldn't make the church fathers normative with regard to my theological conclusions with regard to uh, ecclesiology or otherwise. And I, I can still accept their witness as a historical witness that counts as evidence, counts as testimony, testimony that was sometimes preserved and delivered to us under extremely trying circumstances, again, for which we should be thankful, without actually accepting them as normative authorities theologically. So one way that I put it in the book, I think something like this, we can stand on the shoulders of theological giants without making them normative authorities in and of themselves. And I think that Augustine himself, if I'm understanding that quote I read earlier, actually makes that same claim about his own writings, that canonical writings should be over his writings. I guess I there's like more to that. say about okay. that, like all questions, but... All right, here's, I think, going to be our last question for today from Jay Shy. He says, There was no known correct canon of both Old Testament and New Testament together until Pope Damascus proposed one at Council of Rome, 1382 AD, and was ratified after Hippo and Carthage. Before this, no one was fully correct. Well, we don't know when there was a quote-unquote correct canon that is being held together in different places because the history that we have is by no means a complete history. We have different pieces of evidence that are passed down to us from the church fathers and, and in different places. Um, but there's a lot of reason to believe that the New Testament canon is recognized earlier than that. I alluded to this kind of threefold. You have the Gospels accepted almost immediately. You have the Pauline writings, if they're Pauline writings, accepted in virtue of being Pauline. And then the general epistles and revelation being accepted if they're actually apostolic. So even if the borders are fuzzy for a while, the, the main criteria, what they're looking for, is fairly in place. And what is accepted or rejected on that basis becomes clear as they come to recognize did these books really come from that first generation apostles? And again, there's a lot of evidence for much earlier canon recognition. I mean, Irenaeus quotes uh, one scholar, I think his name is James Hernando, did his dissertation on this. And I think he found that Irenaeus quoted like from like 77 percent of the chapters in the New Testament. Uh, there's strong evidence that there's already by the end of the second century a functional canon among many of the Christians that corresponds to the 27 books of the New Testament. Origin of Alexandria, in one of his writings, uh, refers to the way he refers to the books, if you look at it carefully, amounts to the 27 books. Michael Kruger uh, lays that out in his book. I think uh, it's in one of his one of his commentaries where he, he lays that out. Uh, so you actually have a lot of evidence of earlier recognition of the canon long before you have fourth century lists. Uh, and fourth century, the fourth century codices that we have now. Now, we don't know uh, exactly how they were viewed in all different places, but we do have this kind of testimony of the history of the recognition. All right, we had one more question come in, and uh, it's, it's another one from Jay Shy. He says, John 21, 25, English Standard Version, now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the word the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. I'm not really sure what point he's trying to make here. Do you have uh, a guess? Maybe, maybe he's trying to say that there are things outside of Scripture that would be functionally canonical, and I would agree with that if we had uh, some way to actually know that Jesus said or gave this command with confidence, and that would have a kind of authority. But then again, how would we know that except by appealing and testing it by the authority of those writings that has been passed down to us by that first generation apostles. And most people on all sides of this debate 
uh, when it comes to the intra-Christian debate, agree that those writings are actually genuinely from the first generation apostolic community. And if you grant that, then that would be the standard for testing these kinds of other claims. And if we're going to follow what Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, he says, test all things, hold fast that which is good. How am I supposed to test all things? I think they're supposed to be tested according to the Word of God, according to divine teachings. You have this all, all throughout the Bible itself, that later teachings are tested by earlier teachings. Already in the Old Testament, you have things supposed to be tested by the law of Moses, once Moses is established as a covenantally a prophet with covenantally ruling authority in the uh, Israelite community. And later prophets are tested by him, Isaiah uh, 8.20, to the law and to the testimony. If you do not speak according to this word, there is no light in them. So, of course, I believe that there are truths about God, and this is another mistake that people sometimes make, that when we say sola scriptura, scripture is uniquely normative or sufficient in some way, that we mean by that that scripture includes all the possible teachings that could be true about God. That is, of course, manifestly false on the face of it, because all the teachings that could be true about God to even have all of those, one would have to be omniscient. And I think that that writing at the end of John is just trying to show to us that Jesus said and did many other things that haven't been recorded in these particular books. Uh, but I don't think we have access to those things in any way that gives us confidence to afford them a kind of ruling authority that would be faithful to the other claims that we do have good reason to have confidence in. Yeah, here's a good opportunity to, to bring the definition of sola scriptura that you lay out in the book one more time. And again, the, the number number one, scripture is the uniquely infallible source of divine revelation that is available to contemporary humans collectively. And that's that's your whole point. It's not to rule out that there's any other sources. It's to say that this is the the only infallible source that is available to us today. That's exactly right. And so it can really right. be boiled down to Scripture being uniquely normative as a source and as the standard by which we judge interpretations. And sola does not mean by itself. It does not mean cut off by anything else. This should be clear, I think, if somebody looks in Protestant history when they have the, what's sometimes called the five solas, when they say things like sola fide, by faith alone, or sola gratia, by grace alone. They don't mean by faith to the exclusion of grace. They don't mean by grace to the exclusion of faith. They mean by faith alone in a particular sense. They mean by grace alone mm -hmm. in a particular sense. And we also mean, at least I do, and many other Protestants mean by Scripture alone in a particular sense. That is, by Scripture alone, teachings are to be judged by this norm by, that is not to be normed by other norms other than God himself. All right. With that, let's go ahead and, uh, and start to close this one out. Do you have any concluding thoughts, that we things that we haven't touched on? What yeah. What you got? I think um, I think we basically covered the main I feel things like we covered a lot of ground. I would want to say. And I, I do, again, recognize that all of these are just lines of evidence that there are objections to and counter arguments. They need to be looked at in more detail. So what I would want to encourage people to do is actually look at, at the academic writings on these issues and weigh them carefully and not just rely on the talking points that we're able to bring up uh, in this this kind of a venue, but go and look at uh, the writings that go into these things in more detail. The yeah, you mentioned line, my, yeah. uh, on the, on that note, I was going to say you mentioned Michael Kruger. Yeah, I, I obviously recommend your your book, but what else should people be reading on this subject? Um, there's a lot of good books on the history of canon recognition. I do think that Michael Kruger is a good place to go. Uh, one that wants to see a slightly different view of Sola Scriptura, uh, Keith Matheson's The Shape of Sola Scriptura makes a case. It, it uh, makes a stronger argument for the authority of church tradition than, than I would make. Um, and I engage with that a bit in my book, but I think it's still a helpful conversation partner. Um, there is an article uh, written by Anthony Lane, the exact name of it escapes uh, my memory at, at the moment, uh, but he distinguishes between the history of the relationship between scripture and tradition where he lays out uh, different views where script, tradition is supplementary to scripture in an authoritative way, uh, tradition is coincident with scripture, tradition is ancillary with scripture. Um, those are some of the writings that I would put forward as, as a good starting point to the discussion. All right, I think that's gonna do it for us today. So thanks again for coming on. John, it's been great, and I, I definitely want to bring you back on to talk about your Theodicy of Love. It was the book that I mentioned at the very beginning of the stream. I'm going to put it up one more time just because it's so beautiful. Theodicy of Love, Cosmic Conflict and the Problem of Evil. So it's a book about the problem of evil. 
and you have a pretty unique take on it. And uh, you're, you're also just really good at, at summarizing the dialectic as well. That's the the basic first part of the book that I've gotten through so far. So it's been it's been great to, to read. I just need a, to finish it out. So thanks again for coming on and uh, really looking forward to, to having you on again. Thank you for having me. I look forward to coming on again as well. Excellent. All right. Well, let me talk to the audience real quick. So if you're watching the video still at this point, there's a good chance that you uh, like this ministry, you like the the channel, Capturing Christianity. So what I'm going to do is let you know that we're in the middle of doing 12 courses, 12 apologetics courses for beginners. So if you're into apologetics, you like apologetics, and you would like to uh, learn how, how to do it and some of the basics, if you're just getting started, this is one of the best ways to do it. And we're in the middle of recording these. So we have uh, about six out of the 12 recorded so far. And those are the ones with the check marks there. And so all of those uh, that with, with the check marks are available minus Pascal's wager as of the recording of this video. But if you're watching this, say a month from the time we recorded this, all of the videos will be available at our Patreon account. And the way to access that is patreon.com slash capturing Christianity. The link is in the description of the video to access this video. And also I've done a, a few debates with Matt Frad. And I, I mentioned that during this stream, we've talked about, uh, we did a debate on Sola Scriptura a couple weeks ago at this point, that one's available to patrons. And then we did another one on the Eucharist and what the Bible teaches about the, the Last Supper, essentially. And so both of those debates can be found on Patreon as well. So that's pretty much it. You Also, subscribe, turn on the bell, like the video, comment down below. Let me know your thoughts. That's actually a, a good thing to do, is to let me know what you think about this interview, what you think about Sola Scriptura. Do you think it's self-refuting? Do you think it's nonsense? Do you think that John has laid out a sort of reasonable, a good defense of it? Maybe you're, you're interested in reading the book. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments of this video. And until next time, we'll see you guys later. 